Hi, you're here with Dr. Shannon Wonglerner, communication coach and consultant. Hi, Fred Alejo, food industry professional. And this is our very first episode of The Intersection, where diverse folks converse. The name of our episode is The Busiest Room in the House is the Kitchen. And I actually, we came up with this idea, I came up with the idea for the whole podcast, talking to Fred, and that's why I wanted Fred to be my first guest on this podcast. We got the idea, and we were talking about our culture, we're both Asian Pacific Islander, and... Fred works with food. That's his, that's his work. <laughs> and so we were talking about food and then I came up with the idea, what if we had this podcast as if we were just sitting around a table, you know, in our family home eating food. And right. so I actually sent him some food from Grubhub. So you're going to show him what, we got. so well, these are pot stickers. Pot yeah. Stickers. Which was his favorite. And then and a bin ma, which I've already <laughs> taken a bite out of. <laughs> There's one bite of a bin ma. So that's like a, I think it's a pork. I got you like a barbecued pork. So uh -huh. I hope it's good. Yeah, a little and then, spicy. And then I, I was telling Fred that, because I actually, and I had a lot more because we were having some technological difficulties. So I was telling Fred this is the third time I've eaten it. And I, it seemed like I had a lot because there's actually like four of these. Well, now there's only three. Um, <laughs> and I, there were two, two uh, of these and I ate one and there was more bow and I ate one. And there were six of these. Now there's only two. Yeah. So saying how it actually is a lot of food for a normal person, but I have a really high metabolism and I love food. <laughs> so I just can't stop eating these. So we're going to take a bite of our food and we're just going to start the podcast and just as if we are, we're around the table and I didn't think of we're in the, the kitchen, right? Or in the kitchen. <laughs> I didn't think of the um, the practicalities of this of talking and eating at the same time. Yeah, I guess there's some timing that needs to take place. Right? <laughs> so while you're chewing, I can talk. While okay. I'm chewing, you can talk. I mean, we could have just a period where we're both chewing. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that, that would be very that, interesting. <laughs> I don't think you'll get too many likes on that one. No. You might even get some roasting text on that <laughs> one. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, it's true. The busiest room in the, ki in the, in the house is the kitchen. I mean, if you think about it, you know, when it's just your family and most of the activity, you're getting ready for dinner or if it's a weekend, you're having breakfast, lunch, and dinner, everyone kind of congregates. Or when you have guests over, mm -hmm. it seems like that. Try, try to pay attention next time you have guests over and you're preparing stuff in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Everyone gravitates to the kitchen. And I think even more so, you know, in our culture, um, and I'm sure with a lot of other cultures, and I've, I've seen that in my travels around the world, but food is just uh, as a seriously important part of relationships. Mm -hmm. Getting to know people and getting to know cultures. Um, so everything kind of centers around food. And so I think that's why uh, well, I'm in the food industry and specifically the last few years, a lot of time and spices and mm and herbs, so traveled, I've traveled quite a bit, and it's the same thing. I mean, business dinners take place all around the table, um, and you spend longer, I've spent longer at business dinners or business lunches than I have just sitting in an office or a conference room. I feel like you're so lucky because <laughs> <laughs> if I could have, I used to go to, when I was more of an academic, I used to go to conferences, some conferences, well, some conferences I would go just for the food. <laughs> if I was at like an Ivy League university, I like the conference too, but I would sometimes look forward to the food just as much as the speakers. <laughs> but I, I think you're so lucky if you can, do you feel like being in the food industry, you get schmoozed more with more food and there's more of an emphasis on food than if you weren't, if you were in some sort of other industry, is food more important? Yeah, I think so because, you know, especially in the fields that I've worked in, um, spices and ingredients, it's a lot easier to demonstrate visually and, mm -hmm. and feel your taste buds, how good their product is or, or how good their ingredients are 
it's easier to experience that than just to listen to somebody tell you about the functional ingredients of powdered lion's mane mushroom. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's really boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would actually, <laughs> for me, just because I'm such a food person, I would actually get angry and I might be more <laughs> less likely to take those people on. I'd be like, why are you chasing me? I want to <laughs> eat this food. I'd get really mad. They, so they would know me and they would, they would say like, bring a lot of food, <laughs> like bring a lot because <laughs> she needs a lot of food. So they would actually, uh, that could be to their benefit, I guess, if they're yeah. good. But that's where, you know, in the food industry, obviously for food, I mean, at the end of the day, if it tastes terrible, nobody's going to buy it. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't make it much fun. So there is a lot of tasting and it may not be full meals, you know, mm -hmm. or fully pre prepared meals, but it'll be something like, a, like different teas or, you're tasting this, tasting a seasoning blend. There are certain ways you want to taste the seasoning over and over and over this, the same time, so that way you can kind of get a repetitive taste and mouthfeel. And is what is the? I'm curious. What is the most unusual thing you ever ate? Ooh. On one of okay. these dinners. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was in Kunming, China. So that's south southwest China. I was there with a the supplier. We went to, uh, he took me to lunch. And um, in the Chinese culture, you know, if you're familiar with the Lazy Susan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used those in, our, in our, my grandma's home. Yeah. And all my auntie's home, which is what I, <laughs> actually is sort of what I was imagining when I yeah. you came up with that term, the name for the podcast. I imagined that round table, the Lazy oh, Susan, yeah. all this food, because that's what we did. Yeah. So, and that's, so that's the way they eat, you know, in fact, you know, I have one in my table too. It's built in. And so lazy Susan, for people that don't know, it's like a rotating circle. It's like a tray mm -hmm. that rotates. Yep. And Slides around the table. Whenever the shrimp would come, it's like people were fighting <laughs> like, stop, no, you're not going to get the shrimp, you know? <laughs> yeah. So that was where I had the most interesting dish. Um, a lot of different vegetables and, mm -hmm. and a few different proteins but there was one it actually looked like uh like french fries oh but they were in a bowl and they were sticking up but they were i think like, i know i think i know what they was they were oddly cons consistent in size mm -hmm. length and diameter i was like wow somebody went to were they really crunchy uh-huh <laughs> i think i know what it is <laughs> <laughs> And so I, I grabbed a few <laughs> and put them on my plate because I thought they look like French fries. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, somebody went through some painstaking trouble to make these look precise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the dip came around, I dipped it in there and I ate it. And I was like, that was not a French fry. <laughs> you know? and, and it's not like I didn't like it. It's just when you get a flavor that you weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. I was expecting a potato. Mm -hmm. <laughs> french fry um, and i got this like serious crunchy crunchy fish flavor yeah and oh were, it's different than what i thought it was to me yeah they were fish they were a little oh. layer like two or three inches long and yeah. they had this light batter on it and they were deep fried and they looked like french fries to me yeah that was I probably the most odd i mean that, that i thought it was going to be bird's nest i have had that Oh, you okay? Because that's yeah. me. I think it's technically made with like the yeah. pee and the poop, right? Because <laughs> yeah. I ate it once. My cousin bought it. He's fancy. Yeah. Cause it costs like a hundred dollars or something for each yeah, one. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And I was eating it, and I was like, "What is this?" He's like, "I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later." Yeah, so you don't want to know. Me. It. <laughs> it was good, and then he told me later. I was like, "Oh," but. Yeah. <laughs> Also reminds me of a friend of mine who was very picky and he was at a Chinese banquet and wouldn't eat anything. And then I came back from the bathroom and my two cousins were just like watching him and I was like, what's going on? And he's like, these noodles are so good. And he was eating it. It was jellyfish. So I, was yeah. like, I was like, I looked at them. I was like about to tell them and they're like, Oh, don't do know, that. Yeah. I think they wanted him to eat, but they also thought it was a little fun. They're kind of <laughs> naughty. They thought it was funny. <laughs> but yeah, I think this idea, I really do like this idea of talking about work, 
us coming forward as these mentors, these Asian Pacific Islander mentors from very different backgrounds. Yeah. Within the intersection, that is not just an intersection, but there's a lazy Susan in the middle of the intersection yeah. where we can turn <laughs> in and get all this food <laughs> and, and just share this meal, you know, this family meal and talk about, talk about why we do what we do, how we got to where we are now yeah, and absolutely. just offer our advice and mentoring. I, I just really love that idea. Well, it was great when, when you and I, um, first cross when we first intersected mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um i was at a point in my my career where i was feeling a little bit disconnected mm -hmm. well because i'd been so involved in kind of working my way up the ladder up the chain of command yeah. um and when i finally decided that I had had enough of that. I didn't know how to step back into connecting with the people that I wanted to. A lot of times, a lot of my promotions and, and positions came from recommendations or you know recruitments. But now I want wanted to find something that would make me happy. Yes. Um, one of the things that I discovered after talking to you is it's. Yes, it's all of these accolades are important. All the experiences are important. But what I've discovered, and, and probably everybody knows this now, but what is my story? I mean, mm -hmm. sort of, we hear that on the news, especially with the presidential candidates. Sure. You know, everyone's <laughs> got a story. And that's what most people are interested in because the realization that you brought me to was all the the things that you know are good, but it's your story that tells the people you want to work with about you and your leadership style. Yeah. So, and, and I, I really appreciated you having the ability to kind of draw that out of me. It was almost like a counseling session. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes my <laughs> sessions end up like that unintentionally. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, it was great. You were, you're really good at, at drawing that out. So. I think, and I think when, when I met Fred, he told me something about himself. He said he was in the CPG industry. And I, and I said, what is that? Because I didn't know what it was at the time. So consumer packaged goods. And then I you know, did some research on it and we worked together. And but one of the very first times we spoke, he was talking about his experience in the Central Valley and his father, who's this organic grower of, of vegetables. And I don't know if it was fruits too. Yeah. Fruits and vegetables, a huge garden. But I did, I did definitely get this idea of like the grapes of wrath. And I had this like <laughs> notion of, I mean, maybe not everything that happened in that novel, but just the landscapes, the way they would describe the landscapes and the way yeah. you spoke about where you came from and the people and how, and the love of those people and how that stayed with you. You know, I'm yeah. I also have a background in performance. I do public speaking, but also performance. So I think about, you know, the reason why stories are so important is because it's not just you speaking words, but it's actually your lived experience that you carry in your body. And you want to yeah. say your heart too, or if you believe in spiritual stuff, your spirit yeah. too. Mm -hmm. And then when you tell a story, it changes everything. So you're not, now you're not just Fred Alejo, CPG executive, but now you're, you're this, you're someone who came from this place. You came from this. Not place. a guru. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I said that. I think it sounds cool. <laughs> I said that. That's fine. But, you know, when you, when you have a story, then people can connect to you. Just like John Lennon said, the 4-4 four, four, uh, time signature is the same as the beat of the heart. And they asked, why do you oh, always yeah. do that? And then it connects to humans and people's emotions and bodies universally. And I think the same with stories. So you get an image and Tom Waits also said that too. He said, how do you write a good song? He said, well, you need like the name of a street. So a place, a person, and then some sort of situation, right? Yeah. And so the same with stories. Once you have all those things in place and you can just talk about where you came from and who you are and the people you surrounded yourself with, you start, I, saw, I had all kinds of images of these people and the stories you told and the places you were from. And, and then that's what gave me the idea to the podcast. Cause I, 
I've, I've seen a lot of podcasts, podcasts, you know, political podcasts, people fighting. I mean, right. like, I'm going to nail you with this really hard question, you know, all stuff like that. And this is really not my style. I really am into people growing and learning from one another. So what better way to do that through conversations and, yeah. of course, food always. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a running theme. If I, so another reason how I got this idea is through Eddie Wong's show, Wong's World. I don't know if you got to check that out yet, Fred. No, I haven't yet. I haven't to check it out. So he was like a celebrity chef. He was like this young hot chef. I believe he was in his 20s when he became a celebrity. And he has calmed down. He's kind of a putty mouth, but he has calmed down since then. <laughs> but he's oh, very yeah. he's very entertaining to watch, and the food is always amazing. And he just he talks in the language of the people who are around him and the, the people who created that food, rather than making it this you know high culture, high food culture thing. Uh, yeah. He he blends it all together. So it's like I want to talk in the language of the people around me. Yeah. and connect and again that goes back to storytelling i think it does it goes back to storytelling because the storytelling you know it's a it's it's a it's a way to share yourself with the folks that you work with mm -hmm. it gives them a place or a spot to relate to um, when you're not relatable it's really hard to lead people or mentor people or direct And that's when people. authority comes in. Then yeah. things get very uh, provincial and very hierarchical. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's tough. And, you know, and I've, I've, having been in the military and, you know, my, my folks were, were pretty, you know, pretty strict. Um, but there's that other piece that I learned after the military about relating. Mm -hmm. And actually the, one of my first, uh, it was my officer candidate school commandant. Mm -hmm. She was a female, uh, Captain MacArthur. Um, had a tremendous amount of respect for her, even though 99% of my experience in the active duty military as an enlisted person was with all guys, just mm -hmm. because of the field that I was in. Sure. Um, but I got to see a different type, a different style of management. Mm -hmm. um, and leading people hmm. and you know th that's probably one of the biggest things is is opening uh, opening yourself up to different perspectives yes uh, you may not always use them you may not ever use them but at least you know they're there and you can appreciate that perspective mm -hmm. yeah and I think you know when you do act like the authority even if you, we were talking about this recently is because Fred has managed a lot of people and you know, I have done that in the capacity of the classroom and college and universities. And so mm -hmm. if you put yourself in the position of power that you're in, in this very obvious way, and you kind of pour more, like you put that over people yeah, and show them that and kind of puff up your chest and, you know, it's, uh, it's very intimidating and growth can't happen. Learning can't happen. Fred is very interested in finding the talents in his employees yes. and making sure that they are where they should be because that benefits them and the company. And that's something that really impressed me about Fred too, because I never heard an executive talk like that before and talk about himself as a resource. Cause that, that was one thing you said, you said, I don't really see myself as well, you didn't say this boss man. You didn't, right. say, yeah, you, didn't no. say, you didn't use that word, but you don't see yourself in that way. Like an ego way you see yourself like, I have this experience so I can help you and so I can help my team. Yeah. And so it's a very different <laughs> attitude to have. And, and, and honestly, Shannon, I've been hugely um, lucky to have mentors along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, my parents, um, you know, my parents come from very humble beginnings. Um, and then moving into the military, I was always had really good leaders who, you know, part of, part of their, their job is to exploit your talents. Yeah. You know? I hate to use the word exploit, but, you know, enhance your talents sure. and, and bring them out. Um, so I've kind of taken up pieces along the way. And I've, I can't remember which one told me, but 
um, oh, Officer Candidate School, Captain MacArthur. She was the one that taught us noblesse oblige. Mm -hmm. Noblesse oblige, which is Latin for rank has its obligations. Mm. I remember so, you telling me this before. Yeah. And so that kind of, uh, it's interesting because I never heard the term servant leadership until you yeah. and I talked. Sure. And that's when I started going back and was like, wow, okay, that's my first influence was, was Captain MacArthur and family. Um, and then folks along the way, you know, it's, it's always, I've always felt the people that I reported to, I could go to them with questions, mm -hmm. you know, or I could ask them for help. Mm-hmm. Um, and then and you that, want to be that person too. Absolutely. And that's kind of where it, it's a little bit different. You know, I'm going to shift gears a little bit sure. culturally speaking, but in the Asian Pacific Islander culture, you're not uh, aggressive about going about mm -hmm. getting, you know, this is what I want and this is what I'm going to go get. Um, it's kind of, you work, and you will be recognized when it's when time's appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of I'm in between those two worlds because I grew up in a Western culture where I know what I want, mm -hmm. but then it goes against the family grain to be aggressive about it. Sure. So that's where it's always a challenge. And I actually saw this in the military too. Is um, you know a lot of us APIs in the military. I mean a lot of them were not aggressive about going mm. and making sure that they were in front of the right people to be seen and mm -hmm. ask for things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's kind of a challenge and, and I get that. And you have to, you know, as an API, you have to be comfortable stepping outside of that culture. It's really hard. It's really yeah. hard because I feel it like, is. You know, I taught this class, a public speaking class, and it was all for Asian Pacific Islanders. Uh, a lot of them were Southeast Asian, uh, and some of them were Pacific Islanders, also from a uh, Filipino background. And I had to develop a whole new way to teach. And this is also, this is a different perspective where I hear what you're saying, that it's like, how do I break out of this cultural barrier to which I was always taught to be within and it's who I am. And now I have to be someone else. It's almost like you're pretending, but a cool, a cool way to think about it too, is what if you create an infrastructure around that difference and try to cultivate and help someone grow from there. And that's what I tried to do in that class is I took a look at a, a book and it was a, it's actually a, like a free educational resource. So mm -hmm. you can look at it online and you can print it out. It's much cheaper than the textbooks. Yeah. OER, I think is what it's called. So I got the newest one and it was really good, but it was still, it was not written for Asian Pacific Islanders. So I wrote my own content and presented that to them. And it was based on issues that they have. So some of the issues that they have, it's not as much about being confident because their confidence is different than like oh. a Western status quo concept. It might just oh. be like, I am standing up there talking to you and this is terrifying <laughs> and right. I'm, I'm soft-spoken and it's not gonna get any louder and this is my confidence. It's like, okay. Or uh, for a lot of uh, students who are marginalized, not just API, I would have them go up in groups. It's like, you can take whoever you want. And I remember one class, it would always be these three guys. It was, uh, three African-American students and they were like best friends around the football team. So whenever they had to give a speech and it was just one guy, they would have the other guy, <laughs> one guy. So he had them really close. And he's like, can you, like, this is really close. Like he would <laughs> have them, you know, get closer, get closer. They were yeah. like, <laughs> but it's scary. I mean, when you're Asian Pacific Islander, you're a marginalized person. It's scary to put yourself out there. To me, I saw them what I was doing with them preparing me for what I do now, because now I help prepare people and a lot of diverse people for going out and, and speaking up and being on your own in the job force and yeah. trying to interview and also teaching them. You don't have to be like someone else. You can be like yourself, mm -hmm. but you just have to make sure it, 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 it comes across what needs to come across, come across, comes across so that you are, sure about your abilities that you know that you've done well for yourself that you yeah. feel good about yourself i mean but it's hard i do think it's hard and i don't have all the answers 
Uh, you know, even well, just eye contact piece. is like, I taught them that, yes. you know, cause that was really scary for them. It's yeah. like, no, you have to make, and then I also taught them in the way we're talking about storytelling. If you mm-hmm. do, if you make eye contact, what will happen is it let, it becomes less about you and it becomes about the audience and you connecting yes. with them, which again is terrifying because right. it'd be better just to look above. <laughs> they call it a uh, sprinkler eye contact. So you're looking above everyone's heads or you're just kind of doing this, you know, yeah. sprinkler, but you're not locking eyes and connecting. Yeah. But to me, that's where the real work happens with communication. And I, I probably for you too, in your relationships you've had with clients and coworkers and even people who are your superiors. Oh, a- absolutely. Um, you know, even with, you know, going overseas and talking to suppliers and, and growers, you know, connecting with the guys that are actually harvesting the food, um, that ability to connect is important. And mm-hmm. it does start uh, with the eye contact and sort of, a, you know, in the, in the Asian communities, countries, it's a very humble approach. Mm-hmm. And, and I'd even say, you know, South America, is, you can probably be a little more open, a little more, a bit more gregarious and kind of, fun loving easy going mm-hmm. but in Asian cultures, you can't, yeah you can't do that right off the bat sure. you have to work into that yeah um but yeah i mean and that's that that is always a challenge for folks um especially apis because when you you brought up the interview process yeah um that's that's terrifying mm-hmm. because what is that process well, this, and this is what they tell you. This is what, the way it is in the Western culture, right? This is your chance to brag about yourself, to tell me every great thing you've ever done. Okay, Fred, go. <laughs> okay, I wasn't really raised that way. How but, have you, but you're, I feel like you strike a really good balance. How did you figure out how to do that? Because when I talked to Fred and I asked him about who he was and where he came from and how he got to where he is today and like the mm-hmm. steps he took. I feel like you, you were able to talk about it in a way that wasn't braggy because you were talking about the way that you had skills to help other people. Yeah. So that's, that's where, you know, kind of learning the story format. Okay. Because it, it is a fine line, even in, even for Western cultured folks, it's a fine line because, if you come ac- if you if you come across too with too much bravado, it's like mm-hmm. oh this guy is so full of himself. Too- well, and then there's some cultures that like it, right? Right, right, and there are. And so you know, part of that obviously knowing your audience. But before you know your audience, you have to be you have to be comfortable with sure. telling your story, or telling what you want them to, telling them what you want them to know. Mm-hmm. Um, but. It, yeah, for me, it was super, super hard. My very first interview post university days, um, just because I just wasn't used to it. Yeah. Um, military is a little bit different because they ask you questions, you respond, they put you in situations. You, it's it's more situational interviewing, where when you go into, you know, the private sector, it's okay. Tell me all about yourself. You're like, uh, um, like, <laughs> can you be <agree> okay. specific? <laughs> yeah. And so what worked for me was kind of, you know, using the resume as an outline. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, and, and using that and just kind of bullet pointing through that and sharing a story about each experience that you think would be applicable. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not to say when, when you and I started working, you actually brought more of a storytelling mm-hmm. aspect out of it. And um, so I, I'm even much, there were stories that I didn't realize I had until you mentioned them. And also things you d- did that you didn't know. Yeah, I didn't, I never brought up and <laughs> yes. I didn't think to put on there. Like, you know, talking about um, in a resume or a cover letter back mm-hmm. in the day, I, you just don't put anything personal in it. Sure. Yeah. At all. I mean, that mm-hmm. was, that was the way it was done. But you know, when I got your first draft back, my, my first honest feel was, Oh, 
Now that's really personal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just so just so everybody knows that yeah, you know, that personal part was talking about um, because I'm in the organic food industry, talking about how my dad is an organic gardener um, mm -hmm. with this huge plot of land and, and just grew everything. Um, yeah. we, we actually never bought fruits or vegetables. That's great. Um, but you know that kind of connection. Um, and sharing that as it related to some of the companies that I might be interested in, or just the industry in itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really applied. And I never thought to put that in to a cover letter. Mm -hmm. But um, everyone that I've shown it to has, has, and I've never said anything. I just hand it to him. And they all comment how much they like that story part. Yeah. About my dad and, and my experiences and how it relates to the industry and what I would bring to the table mm -hmm. with regard to working with their team, either consulting for their team and kind of growing their team or becoming part of their team. Yeah, and to me that, that is like, is sort of the difference between being friends with someone and having that trust. Yeah. Because this is the kind of thing, and this is what does make it sort of risky for some people who aren't used to that approach, but it does have a payoff because when you're friends with someone, you invite them over, maybe they didn't start out as friends, but there was some sort of, there was something likable about them and something that made you relate to them. Yeah. And so you're kind of skipping some steps because now you're saying, right. you know, I'm open. This is who I am. Yeah. And then now they feel like, wow, I know you. And yeah. they do in a way because everything in that letter is truthful. Yeah. It's your story. Yeah. And it's almost as if, you know, they can look and see your trajectory and path. They can see the places mm -hmm. you walked almost like a movie, like a film. Yeah. And they're comf now they're comfortable with you. I mean, I can't think of a better way to enter a job, to enter a role in a company, but to have people feel warm about you and for you to open up like that. Well, and, and you know what's interesting, you know, throughout this process is I, I now would encourage hiring managers or executives to, to try and get that story. Mm -hmm. I mean, Yes, I can use Word. Yes, I can program. Yes, I can do all these things. But to be honest with you, you can also teach that. Mm -hmm. So what I'm looking at, and everybody always talks about fit. Well, how yeah. do you interview for fit? And, and how much of that is emotional? It, a feeling, a, a right? Some of it, right? I mean, that's not something that you just measure mm -hmm. with any kind of metric. But it's more, it is really a feeling. And think about how many times you guys are, are executives and, you know, just go with a gut feel. Mm -hmm. How much better would that gut feel have been for you if you knew something a little more personal or personable mm -hmm. about sure. that individual, a little more about their story? Because now you take their experiences and you, it either fits in with your current culture or you think it augments it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be one of the two. Um, and obviously, if there's a third, it just doesn't fit, then you, you made the right decision mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. So, but that's where I would um, kind of steer managers, hiring managers to kind of take a look at, you know, look for those people who are telling the story. And, and see how their story fits with your story. Because yes. that story doesn't happen just by itself. Yep. It happens, it happens with other people and it happens yep. in a larger way yeah yeah i mean uh, imagine hearing a hermit story well, mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't hear a story right? yeah you, <laughs> well you might hear someone relating to nature or, right you know something like that right but yeah for the most part you know human interaction the best way to experience that or understand it is through their stories mm -hmm. i agree yeah, I think that, you know, and this goes back to the kitchen table thing mm -hmm. is when we're sitting around the kitchen table, you know, we we're closer to like what John Lennon said in that heartbeat and we're closer to our families. You can even think, go back to childhood and birth and when your heartbeat was, you know, connected to your mother, when right. you had your head against her heart and, you know, you could, you could hear it, you could feel it. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's something that's lacking people don't think about that as a fundamental it's something that's lacking when you go into an interview process and it might also be at the level of what how your body is responding yeah 
because now you're breathing hard, you're, you know, you're anxious. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to forget about what's happening physically when really you should look at what's happening physically and try to get in tune with that. And I think that's what storytelling does too. Absolutely. And I mean, it takes away the angst of, instead of me being judged, this is my opportunity to share the story of mm -hmm. Fred or yeah. of Shannon. Because that's what a lot of folks, when you go into it, I, myself included early on, when I went into interviews, I saw it as a, um, a judgment session. Yeah. You know, yeah. And I think, I think most people see it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And if you feel judged, you're going to feel like, you know, closed off. Closed and off. You feel, and and you feel robotic answers. Robotic. And then you feel <laughs> defensive. Yeah. Right too, and that's not none of that is good. Then you're, yeah, it might as well just be over at that <laughs> point. <laughs> yeah, start. I was thinking about some stuff that you had said when, and maybe we could talk about this a little. Maybe about how your uh, your connection to the earth and the people that you were around in the Central Valley and yeah. the town you came from and how that carries forward into what you do now and what, how, what you've done as a manager and as a leader. Because I do feel that's something special because that's something that is lived. It's something that's in your body. It's something mm -hmm. physical. It's something that to me, like what I said in the post is when I start, first listened to you, I, I didn't just think storyteller. I was like, this guy is a poet. Like the things you said. <laughs> so there was so much imagery and it was like very beautifully worded and, you know, and, and I remember writing some things down, I'm like, yes, this, you should use this one for the cover letter. Yeah, it's just like something you said, but it's like, that's a good line. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, it was interesting because right out of, right after I graduated, um, you know, I thought I wanted to be an attorney. I thought I wanted to go to law school. I thought I wanted to go to Wall Street and, you know, work in the finance industry. Yeah. And, uh, I just decided that was not what I wanted to do. But then when you graduate, you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So I actually took a job with a winery and worked in, as a lab technician. So, I mean, I took the, the $10 an hour job <laughs> um, just so I could get the experience. Mm -hmm. And that's where I just kind of fell in love with um, food and beverage and the manufacturing process. I learned quite a bit from, from that experience. And that's when I decided I, I actually fell into something that I enjoy doing um, and have, have enjoyed ever since. Um, but a lot of times, you know, when you're working your way up the ladder, you, you, or you're working your way up into different positions, um, you got to have something to draw back on. And yeah. really all, all we really have, especially at that age is, you know, I had military experience, um, so I definitely had some exposure to leadership schools and, and different courses and stuff. And that's like working with my dad out in his garden, understanding how things grow or why things grow, um, why you don't put, I won't use the expletive, but... <laughs> You want to keep everything natural. You don't want to put <laughs> synthetic uh, pesticides or herbicides. Mm -hmm. He was hugely against that. So my dad was an organic grower before. So he was really time. ahead of his time. Oh my god! And 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 honestly, how did he come to that? Did he was did he have a science background too, or did he no. just he just knew it? He knew he knew it, learned it growing up, and then trial and error on his own. Um, but when you go to developing countries, they don't have access to Monsanto. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have to figure out how to keep the bugs away or how to prevent certain illnesses in their plants naturally. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is organic gardening. It's kind, of it's kind of weird because everybody says conventional when they're referring to mm. pesticides and herbicides. Yeah. But the term conventional in and of itself means that's the normal conventional. It's standard. Standard. 
-hmm. but that wasn't. That's only been in the last 50 to 60 years. Organic gardening was happening, you know, was the original conventional, right? They didn't use pesticides and herbicides. And what about food in general too? Yeah. Like there was wholesome, more wholesome food. Yeah, well, take bread for for example. Bread, you know, you buy a loaf of bread in, in the U.S. and how bread is made, uh, um, they strip out all of the vitamins and, and the minerals, and then they add it back. Mm. So you, you got to kind of question when you start over manufacturing something. Mm -hmm. um, our bodies were were have evolved for a certain intake of food. Mm -hmm. And when you start changing up how that food is when you take it into your body, um, something changes. Sure. Right? And we don't know what that is. I mean, there's some long-term effects, and I'm not a medical professional by any stretch. Um, but, I mean, just common sense tells you that something's, if it's not in its most pure natural form, and you're taking that and changing it, Mm -hmm. What is that doing to you? And in some cases, it may do nothing to you. Mm -hmm. But in other cases, like bread, you know, why why did we strip all that out only to add it back? It and just it, never made sense to me. Do you think the reason to do that is for greater like labor process and like to make it, more money it, and to? It certainly is. I mean, uh, I my opinion is that money motivates a lot of a lot of um, improvements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or high speed processing or manufacturing sure um, it may be because labor was short and had to figure out how to process it with fewer people um, you know and not that any of those things are inherently bad but they can't be totally good for the food yeah um, or your bodies to have body. all of that right. processed highly processed food right I mean, we say that with right. Yeah, I mean, this. I don't know how many I have eaten so far. I feel like, um, well, this is my second. I ate. I already ate the chicken curry bow. <laughs> I've been yeah. talking too much. No, it's okay. Why don't you eat? I don't know what I'm going to get to talk about. <laughs> oh, mentoring. I can start and then you okay. want to eat. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a we have a portion of the podcast where we offer our mentoring to people who perhaps are starting in our field or just any diverse people. It could be early career or mid career. Because I'd see Fred is like a pretty mature person in his industry. And I'd see say that I'm like I don't know if I'm late. I'm like mid late. I don't know if I'm late <laughs> career. I'm somewhere in there. I'm not early career. And so, you know, we, we got to where we're at by practicing certain things by networking and doing things like that in our industry. Mm -hmm. but we also got to where we're at because of our values and making sure that we walk that walk that we, that we, that we actually follow through with what we believe in. I think it's really right. important and to have that integrity. And so some advice that I can offer and I think about the trajectory of things that I've done is to, in some ways, I think it's really great to have certain opportunities, but I think bad treatment is really bad. And I think that this is something that's changing now, you know, with me too happening and with, uh, I can't remember what the legislation was. There was something that passed recently where it said that LGBTQ people could not be prejudiced for being of that identification or sexual orientation. It, it passed in the Supreme Court, I'm pretty sure. And it was actually something really positive that happened from something that Trump had done against us. And maybe it had to do with healthcare and maybe employment. Right. I think it was both of those. Huh. And so, you know, things are changing. I mean, certainly there's still a lot of bigotry and difficult things that I think happen to us as diverse professionals. But I also think that there, again, this goes to story and voice, mm -hmm. that people's voices are rising up. And so people tolerate a lot less. 
We have social media, which is mm -hmm. wonderful and can be very scary if you're doing something bad and you get exposed. Right. And so, I mean, there are all these, you know, ways that are sort of like power to the people ways that we can have our own little news station through Facebook and Instagram. And, yep. You know, so it, it's good though, because people who are in comfortable positions who perhaps have been doling out these abuse abuses to marginalized people, to women and gotten away with it for decades. Now they can't do it anymore. And so I guess some of this way where I'm going with all of this is I feel like early in my career, I just took a lot. I just, someone would speak badly to me or about groups or in certain situations, say racist things and sexist things, homophobic. And I just kind of shrunk. I didn't feel like I had any power to speak up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being a graduate student, things like that, maybe I didn't have any power to speak up. But when I look back at it, so some of these things that happen, I wish I would have spoken up. And so I guess that's some advice that I have for young people today or people of color who, for myself, queer people, is that you always have a voice. And I think there will be people there to support you. Uh, and make sure that the opportunities that you choose are with people who have the same values as you. And then yeah. you go along a path where you can keep your integrity intact. It's so important. I think I have all kinds of stories of friends who didn't follow that advice and changed their path to something else. And it was, it's, these are very sad stories. Yeah. So people who, uh, friends of mine who are artists in these like Northwestern or these different prestigious universities and programs and got sexually harassed by their professor. And then they just were so upset and traumatized. They just left. And I don't know, I guess you can't really give advice and say, you should have stayed. You should have spoken up because in that situation, you might've not had power, especially in that time period. But uh, I do think things are changing now. And I, I think of this now when I have joined, when I have collaborations or even when I take clients, you know, uh, if a client says something that doesn't feel right or they right. seem bigoted or they're not treating me well, I don't want to work with that person. It's not worth it because it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. So I guess another part of my advice is that even if you're at a beginning stage in your career, realize that you're contributing to and you always are a value. It's not just like, oh, what a great opportunity. I get to do this thing with this company. It's also like, oh, what a great opportunity that they get to have me on board. Right. And always keep that because if someone does try to, you know, someone has a bias or a prejudice, you have that with you. You have your mm -hmm. integrity intact and you can hopefully respond in the moment or find the appropriate channel to respond. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. Um, and, you know, along the mentoring lines, that's, that's always been, um, you know, in the community and folks of color, uh, the, the, the era that I've grown, grown up in and matured in was kind of in that transition phase. Mm. And so it seemed like early on, just things were accepted. Yes. Um, but the further I moved along, uh, especially in the positions that I moved into, I felt absolutely more comfortable saying something. Mm, so, good. I think about what is it? Uh, John Lewis said, "If you see something, you need to say something." Yes. And I firmly believe that. And uh, at the end of the day, it's easy to say well, you just need to say something. Sure. Um, but there's a real is it, there's a real reality of. I probably, if I say something, I may not get the next promotion. It's true. I that's the hard over, part. And that's the challenge. So there it's are not, certainly, yeah, it's not an easy thing. It sure isn't. But I agree with you today. There are more avenues that you can, there are more approaches that you can take mm -hmm. to call something out. And, you know, you don't have to be aggressive when you call yeah. it out. You know, it's, it's something as simple as saying, you know, that's, that really kind of made me uncomfortable. Sure. Um, you think, you know, is there another way to, to look at this? Uh, or ask a question. So if someone a, yeah. tries to do something, you say, so are you saying that you're going to do this? 
And then they, yeah. oh, I guess I did just say that. Yeah. They have to think about it. I was, I was in a position, um, this was probably, this is in the very recent past, probably three years ago. Um, I was with the executive of a company. We were on the phone with an individual in another state. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about relocating there, the organization there, or, or part of the organization there. And the question came up about labor. And the gentleman on the phone said, well, you know how these people are here. Ooh. And I kind of let that go. Sure. Yeah, you know, because I was just listening to the presentation. Mm -hmm. And when we got off the phone, the executive asked me, what do you think? And I said, I don't think you should work with him at all. Yes. Um, because I just Googled really quick you know, the area that we were looking at. And it was majority low income black people yeah sure and i said I, I i wouldn't recommend working with them and i told them i told them why mm -hmm. and um you know and, and obviously uh i don't know if he i'm sure he didn't do it because of me because it was just the right thing to do i mean economics aside there's never a such a situation where i have to betray my ethics yeah it's true because if the opportunity is in one place, I guarantee you there's an opportunity in a ton of other places. It's not so, worth it. Yeah, it, it totally isn't worth it. And I felt good about saying it. And not to mention, I'm glad that that guy didn't get the business. Um, but other opportunities popped up. Yeah. And that's how it happens, I uh -huh. think. And I think that's a karma thing. I, I believe <laughs> so, that. I, I really do. I think that's a karma thing. When you start doing it, things start happening that that were you know, two or three times better than what you were originally looking at and wondering if you made the bad decision. Same thing goes with the, with the position. You know what, at the end of the day, that is not the best position you will ever have. Mm -hmm. You're not yet your best person. Sure. So, yeah, it's, say, it's okay. really, oh, I'm sorry. No, go no, ahead. go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, this kind of goes back to the storytelling thing, because when you tell your story and put yourself forward that way in this very open way where you show where you've come from and the people you've been around and, you know, the story, the, the, the dialogue, the conversations you've had with those people, it's like you're showing them, you're showing them this part of you about your childhood and your family. But if you, let's say you were to go into this exchange with this man, it's sort of like the storytelling ends. Now you can't be open. No. You can't, you don't want to share that stuff with him because he sounds like this bigot, you know? Yeah. So now it's like, you can't be really who you are. So then it's like, what are you doing? Yeah. And I think I've been in situations, intolerable situations like that, just being like the solo business person of this, of this company and people trying to take advantage of me or thinking that some great opportunity came up and then starting to do it and like, this is terrible. And I just, yeah. like you said, I had to end it. And then actually some really wonderful things came to me after that. Yeah. Cause my, I wasn't putting my energy there cause it would have just sucked my energy. I wouldn't have been able to put it elsewhere to meet other people. Or if you see it karmically, like my energy just wouldn't be out there. Right. right. It right. would be stuck in this terrible little abusive you know, cave or this little hamster one. I don't know, I'm making this movie. Yeah. I think of like a hamster wheel, just like someone <laughs> furiously like running and not getting anywhere, just running and running. Yeah. And I, yeah, I'm, I think I've, I've held it to myself not to do that anymore for myself, yeah. but also for the good of other people. Cause if you think about if you would have entered into business with that man and now you're, you're committed cause this is a commitment. Yeah, now I have to work with this. Guy. You have to work with him maybe for a year to five years, however long the contract is, and it's not it's like a poisoning. Yeah. I don't mean to be melodramatic, but <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's kind of like a poisoning because now you have to walk around with that just the same way you carry other people's uh you know, interactions with you in your body. Now you have to carry that thing in your yeah. body. You're like, ugh, gross. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know what I would have done if, if the decision would have been 
made to go there. But I, I probably would not have been able to stick around. But yeah, um, I, I'm glad the decision was made. You know, in the manner in which I thought it should have been made. And like I said, some great other other opportunities came up that were just leaps and bounds ahead of the one that we were looking at. And I think this goes back to businesses and work, not just being about, and career, not just being about mm -hmm. money. It can't yeah. be yeah. because we're putting our whole lives, our whole bodies, our souls into this you know and you, it's not just about getting a paycheck but it's about making sure all of that keeps, stays intact and that you, you spend can, the majority of your life working with these people yes the majority of your waking hours working mm -hmm. with these people because you sleep eight hours a day i mean that <laughs> so that's a third of the day gone just to sleeping mm -hmm. so a little less than two-thirds is spent working with these people yeah so it's why true. put yourself in a position where you're just compromising your well-being. Your well-being and basic human values. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I agree. So do you, I'm wondering, do you have any advice for any particular people? And it's up to you. I do. Actually, okay. you know, for, for folks in the uh, API community, um, especially if you've you've not been in the Western culture long enough to understand you really need to step outside of the Asian culture in terms of asking, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think asking for help or asking, asking for yes. help, yeah. asking, you know, how do I get promoted? How can I get to the next level? Even if it's money related, how do I make more money? How mm -hmm. can I get paid more? Um, you know, that's probably the biggest piece of advice is, is stepping outside of that. They're going to recognize me box and I'll get rewarded when it's my time. Mm. Doesn't happen that way in the mm -hmm. Western, Western world. You know, and that's just, the it'll US, just but, never yeah, happen. It won't. And you'll be stuck in what you're doing for I mean, a while. Whole life. Until you, yeah. yeah until you <laughs> realize that, you know, you could have done more, wish you could have done more. That's the biggest piece of advice. And I think there's a way to, something that I do a lot when I work with Asian Pacific Islanders is like, I feel like there's a way to phrase things and help people understand. So like what you just said, asking questions, it is scary. And I think it is that saving face thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's as much in Pacific Islander culture, but I know where I come in East Asian culture, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a thing. <laughs> like you don't want to yeah. ask oh, yeah. questions because you look stupid. And you embarrass yeah. yourself, you embarrass your family. Yeah. Like you right? should have known. You well, should have known, right? It's how do I know if I don't ask? <laughs> yeah. It's like, I don't, yeah, it's hard though. It's just a yeah. hard thing. But I think a way to flip that is just, is to think of how I think a lot of APIs also value humility. Like you were saying the opposite mm -hmm. of being like kind of braggart type mm -hmm. personality. So you say like, that is a place of humility. It's not a place of shame, but it's a place where you're admitting you don't know something and you want to, you want need help and you, right. right. And then it's also a place of community yeah. because when you ask a question, you create a bridge or you create a connection with a person yeah. in front of you. So now you get to work together on something, even if it's just that short conversation. Yep. And the other piece of that too is, you know, not only embracing kind of the Western approach to, um, uh, advancing yourself in the business ranks, but you're all, you always have to be mindful of home. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you are going to have to find that balance because if you completely embrace Western culture, then you go back to a family event and, you know, in the Ilocano language, it's called pala pala, which is all that, that guy's a braggart, you know, mm. he's just talking to be talking when the reality is you just have shifted into more of a Western culture. So you got to be able to kind of move back and forth yeah. a little bit. And that's why I mean, be mindful of, of where you came from. I think you're right. I think, you know, that's something that when I decide, when I made this shift in my business around the time we met, actually, I had made mm -hmm. that starting to make that shift. And then I really made it. And I wrote an article called, a uh, love letter to my first rainbow flag where I came out 
publicly on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and all my professional platforms. And that was really scary because it was me saying who I really am, you know, and not, I've also, I was saying this to a friend of mine that I was actually comfortable being gay anywhere, but, but Asian restaurants, <laughs> like Chinese restaurants, especially. And she, she was looking at me and I was like, she was like, so why? And I was trying to explain why. So I said, because being biracial, I'm already not accepted. Like, I always know more Chinese than they think. I remember one time this woman said something to me. <laughs> and I think I told you the story because I wanted, I didn't want to sit in the, in the, uh, on the, on the counter. I wanted to sit in a booth and there was no one in there, but she was like, no, you have to sit at the counter because if you're only one person. And I was like, there's no one here. Like if a party comes, I'll shift over. But like, I was uncomfortable. I'd been working all day. Yeah. And I was like being really difficult about it. And then she called me a fat, rich bitch. Oh, <laughs> I thought it was a horror. I think it was a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> so she called me that. And then I said to her back in Chinese, hey, like I actually speak some Chinese. I said that to her in Chinese. And she looked at me like this and she turned around. She ran to the kitchen. <laughs> she never came out. She just stayed in there the whole time. <laughs> and then, yeah, so she was terrified, right? But um, so I told my friend that, that I was afraid of being gay in a Chinese restaurant. And then my friend's black. And she was like, Shannon, do you know where I would go if I was afraid of being judged? If I was like, you know, afraid of being looked at or, you know, and she's like, I would not leave the house. That's what she said. Right. And I felt like, I felt like a jerk. Cause I realized like, even though I have that fear, you know, I'm still privileged because I, I can say it or not. Right. Right. Uh, but I think going back to our mentoring, you know, being who you are and being who you really are and not being ashamed and just mm -hmm. showing up who you are, like to an yeah. interview or to your first day at, at your job, let's say you have a new promotion, showing up as you are is going to feel so much better than pretending to be someone else or yeah. hiding. Because I feel yeah. even if you're not obvious about it, people sense it when you're hiding. You're hiding something, you're hiding something about yourself, mm -hmm. and you will not, I feel like you won't succeed as much. Yeah. Because you're, you're, really, you're on someone else's path. You're not yeah. on yours. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. So, so maybe, so our last part of the podcast, I always ask Fred, I don't know if you liked it or if it was annoying, because I would ask at the end, what is your takeaway for the session? And I thought it would be fun if we had a takeaway for today for the podcast. Sure. So I think my biggest takeaway is You know, understanding you need to know your story mm -hmm. and you need to be comfortable sharing your story. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying you have to get deep into all the skeletons in your closet. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear that. But you have a good, everyone has a good story to tell mm -hmm. and relate it to either what job you're inter interviewing for or uh, the people that you're working with, the people that you're mm -hmm. managing or going to manage or that you're being managed by. Mm -hmm. So that's probably my biggest takeaway. This, yeah. Is, is understanding how, understanding and appreciating your current fit or where you want to fit. Yeah, I really like that. I think kind of playing off of that, I think something that I thought about today and something I haven't thought about is how story connects to where you've been and mm -hmm. who you are, you know, uh, like actually physically where you've been in your body and then culturally you can think that in your body, you know, too. And that when you tell your story and you are open and you brave that, then you are showing up as like who you authentically are and it allows for everyone. It kind of has, it could, it could have this ripple effect Right. Where now someone else sees you and then they say, oh, that's like who I am too. Why am I afraid of that? <laughs> you know, and then they want to be who they are now. Right. And so it serves as this wonderful example that could have that ripple effect. And so I'd say, you know, don't be scared if you want to try something new or you want to actually go after that promotion because 
if you've earned it and if you show up who you are, then you're much more likely to get that. Absolutely. Because now you're your best self. Yep. And you've just shown initiative and you didn't even have to be told to show initiative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did it on your own. Okay. Anything else? You no. didn't get to eat. I felt like. Oh, that's okay. I I'm feel gonna, like I'm gonna eat after. Okay, I know. I feel like I was eating a lot. Like I have, I, 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 I used to get made in front of when I was little because my cheeks are kind of big. I mean, when my cheekbones are high, when I eat, like I look like that, like really big, like a chipmunk. So I was, I started to get self conscious as I was eating because I've never eaten on a podcast before. Like, am I looking like a chipmunk? What's happening? Oh well, I'll just eat, just keep eating. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Fred, for being no, on our for first me. episode. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your food and your day. <laughs> okay. And I'll just sign off. This is Shannon, Dr. Shannon Wong Lerner, communication coach and consultant. Fred Alejo, food industry professional. And you've just heard the first episode of the Intersection Diverse Folks Converse. The busiest room in the house is the kitchen. Thank you for joining us.